so today, <clears throat> you know, I want to talk about this guy, Wild Bill. Um, how did I come about? I'm going to kind of tell you the story of how I kind of put this together. I it was about 20 years ago. I still active duty in the Navy. I read the book uh, Omaha to Okinawa by William Bradford Huey, and in the book there was about six pages dedicated to uh, Bill Painter here, Wilfred Painter, and it, it kind of it really resonated with me because he he was uh, the way Huey described him was uh, was quite unique, and uh, he seemed like a really interesting person, and so. Uh, Years later, you know, I, ha I hadn't forgot it. And then when I got into the position I'm in, I started to kind of look into it a little bit and, uh, you know, found uh, that it was a little bit difficult uh, to, to find information on him because he was a behind the scenes actor, behind the scenes guy who was doing some incredible things, which I'm going to uh, kind of cover here shortly. Um, and in the meantime, what, but then I, I went to, I came, went to San Diego for this very same conference. Uh, it was in 2020. I went to the CB Museum up in Port Wenemi after the, after the symposium. And I was uh, fortunate to get uh, a bunch of documents on, on uh, Bill Painter. <clears throat> and then from there, I started to look in, you know, in some books and stuff. And anywhere I searched, it was just snippets, snippets of information on on uh, on this individual, um, and I have found stuff in our archives. Uh, but really, I'm waiting for the uh, to get to the national archives so I can go in there because I think that's where I'm going to really find some uh, some meat, you know, on, on uh, Bill Painter. So, <clears throat> Bill Painter, he. Um, he, just to let you know that he made, he was the youngest captain in the U.S. Navy. Uh, and he moved up the ranks very quickly. And there's a reason which you will see as I step through my PowerPoint, I've got a number of slides to go through. Um, but this is about the island hopping campaign in the Pacific and the people behind it. We all know about the island hopping campaign. We've obviously read stories about it. We've, we've talked about it maybe a little bit. I think a few people have kind of, kind of touched on it a bit, a little, uh, but there, but up to this point, you know, I, there's really not been a whole lot of the, you know, the people behind the scenes who are actually doing these things to, to enable, to enable the campaign to go forward. And this is where Bill Painter comes into play. So let me just start with, so Bill Painter is from Dryad, Washington. He was, you know, born in 1908 up in the Northwest woods of Washington. He grew up, uh, his, really his family, his mother, his father, and him. Uh, they grew up in a lumber business. Uh, they worked for uh, probably a, a several different lumber businesses. Uh, but this was like the epicenter of uh, lumber back in the, back in those days uh, in the North Pacific, along the North Pacific Railroad. His mother was a cook in the lumber camps. His father worked in the lumber camps as well. And Bill, as he got older, um, started to work there. He went to college and it, to the University of Washington in uh, 1926. 27. He graduated as an engineer. And his, his, uh, his, one of his, the main things that he did was he had a, a knack for finding uh, areas to run the rail system and building railroads. So he had a little experience in that pile driving and, and rigging. So that was his thing back, back in the early days. And this is what he did in the summers when he went to college. He went into the, you know, into these, uh, into the, into the woods and did this during the summer while he uh, was at college. He was an avid uh, polo player. Uh, he, he, you know, he, he was a rower in college. And by the time when he, when he, uh, gra he graduated, he went into the uh, Marine Corps uh, and he went to 
Naval Air Station, Squanum, Massachusetts. It's just up the road. There's nothing there anymore, but it's uh, right between Boston and Quincy. And he went into flight training and he, he, never, he didn't make it. He got dropped. So he went back to, to Washington, um, jumped, on a, uh, jumped on a freighter, worked in the, uh, in the engineering department of the, of the freighter. And when he got to Shanghai, China, he jumped ship went to a Texas oil company uh, business to look for a job. <laughs> and they wanted to know, one of the questions was, uh, uh, what do you know about you know, taxes on oil in China and all this kind of stuff? He said, well, I don't know anything about it, but I'll tell you what, I'll go and I'll find out and I'll get back to you. He did, and they hired him as a design engineer. And uh, from that point on, he went into, uh, he started to, uh, you know, really get into the, the construction uh, trades. Uh, he was doing work in the in the mountain areas outside of uh, Shanghai uh, and within Shanghai proper in the suburb area, building a number of things. Um, what you see here is just some of the, let me just kind of describe them. One of the things he did when he arrived in uh, in, in uh, China in uh, 1929 was he joined the Shanghai Volunteer Corps, which was, uh, you know, all the different uh, nat uh, countries, all the, the, the colonies, the Germans, the British, the French, the Dutch, they all had their, they all belonged to this Volunteer Corps. And, you know, he belonged to the, to the, the American one uh, that uh, defended uh, or protected the international settlement that was going on and protecting their their, their trade and all that from Chinese bandits and, of course, the Japanese. Um, the document on the right, the, the medal, he was part of the uh, Suchow Creek battle in 1937, uh, and he was awarded that for valor, um, extraordinary valor and brave, bravery during that period. <clears throat> on the left, you'll see a, a dry dock in the Kainan Dock and Engineering Works, uh, he ended up uh, building, uh, uh, or actually ex probably expanding that particular dock there, and he built the largest dry dock or graving dock, as they would call it back then, uh, in China. Um, you know, before he left, I think that was around 1935, 36, 37 period. Um, he also built um, this this nightclub called Ciro's. Interestingly. Uh, there was another Ciro's of the same owner, I, I, I believe, uh, in, in Los Angeles on Sunset Boulevard. So he built Ciro's and he built uh, the American Laundry Machinery Company, these buildings. And this is just a, just really a snippet of, of, the, of the projects that he, uh, he did, uh, he, he was involved in during his, during his time. Uh, he, after two years, in, in uh, Shanghai, he quit the, the Texas Oil Company and he created his own, his own business, WL Painter and Company, because he was, he was really an entrepreneur by heart. And, you know, over time, he was just making money hand over fist. So by 1935, uh, he ends up, he ends up uh, partnering with another individual named John Graham. Uh, and, and they formed the, the Graham and Painter uh, Company, and, uh, and, and, and they really started to expand. They opened up the Shanghai office of Graham and Painter. They, they had the, Gra Graham's father already owned the, uh, the Graham business in Seattle, Washington. And, and you know, so Graham Jr. was, a, was a, uh, also a, a graduate of the University of Washington as well. So they knew each other. Uh, and they opened up a, a office in New York City as well. But by 1937, uh, with the Japanese, you know, occupation and invasion and all that, um, where he got this this uh, this medal, uh, they had to shut down the shy, uh, the Shanghai office. And he ends up going back to uh, going back to to uh, Washington. Uh, but before before that. So while he's in Shanghai, 
he's into all the uh, equestrian uh, equestrian uh, events, polo and, and all this stuff. He, he wins the, 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 the revered pink coat. Uh, and you can see him here on the horse uh, doing his doing his thing. So he I think, you know, um, he's he learned, obviously, riding horses. Uh, in his early age in, in, in the lumber camps because they used a lot of uh, horses, you know, back then along with the railroad. Um, <clears throat> so he goes back to, to, to Washington. He goes back to his alma mater, the University of Washington, and he enrolls, uh, he, he, he does research at the university on soil characteristics and concrete structures um, while he's there. And during that same time, he joined the Marine Corps and as an engineer, but I don't think he was with the Marines, yeah, it was probably like eight months or so, uh, and ends up going into transfers into the Navy's, you know, Civil Engin Engineering Corps uh, at that time. Uh, let me move this. So that's him on the, uh, on the horse. So he's in the Civil Engineering Corps and he's based in Long Beach, California. Uh, the day Pearl Harbor was attacked, he, he was building a, uh, a dry dock. And within a week, he's, uh, he's in Pearl Harbor. So they sent him to Pearl Harbor. Um, he arrives and he, he's tasked with uh, uh, raising the uh, battleships California and West Virginia. And <clears throat> it's just, a that's a picture of West Virginia. Uh, California and this picture had already been moved, but they were literally right next to each other. <clears throat> this picture here is on the California. Um, Will Painter is the, is the guy that's leaned over on the left-hand side with a rubber diving suit on because he's diving with the divers. He's all over the place. Um, really leading the way on these uh, these salvage operations, and they're you know they're having this little conference here uh, with uh, at the time Captain uh, later Admiral uh, Homer Whalen, who is at who was at the time the fleet engineer, uh, and he was the primary salvage officer for all of all of the Pearl Harbor salvage operations that were having to be dealt with, which was quite a lot. Um, and you can see the blueprints laying there and, and, you know, painter got a smirk on his face and, uh, it, you know, so. So what they decided to do was with the, the, um, they ended up using initially like steel coffer dams, which, you know, were patches to seal holes and, 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 and that, uh, you know, on, on all these damaged ships, but they they realized right away that um, there, there's a better method. They, they utilized uh, lumber, wood, uh, and concrete. And it wasn't just the Navy now because you had, you had the Navy folks, you had the Pacific Bridge Company uh, that was also there with the, uh, handling these salvage operations as, long with, as well as uh, Port, uh, Nor uh, Nor I want to say Norfolk Naval Shipyard, uh, Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard. Um, but what they decided to do, there was so the damage to these ships were so tremendous uh, with gaping holes, uh, you know, like on the West Virginia, I think it was about uh, three, uh, 300 uh, feet long uh, holes because it took approximately, I think it was like seven torpedoes on the one side. But they, in the top left, you see a patch going into the water, wooden patch. And <clears throat> What they would do is they would fill the bottom, the, the one under it, you see some gentlemen down there working. What they're doing is they're filling it with uh, underwater concrete on the bottom to seal the, the areas on the bottom of the patch where it goes, where the curvature of the keel bottom is. And, and then all the way up the sides. And what they would do is they would brace it with timbers and then steel I-beam and with, with cable. Um, here you see on the right, this, it's called a tremi pipe. It's basically a funnel. And you see Painter up here uh, with the guys, uh, you know, they're pouring the concrete down into the, into the patch. <clears throat> uh, like I said, this guy was all over the place. 
he was uh, uh, really, really in, very engaged. <clears throat> Here, you know, so in this case, you got the California coming into the dry dock at 1010 dock uh, with the the pumps going. They're uh, uh, Panoma deep well pumps that they're using. Initially, there was they were short on everything as far as material. Uh, to to raise the ships, but you know over time, uh, you know they they started to get um, the equipment they needed and and all this. So you got you got the California. They raised it uh, probably with under a hundred days. Uh, they raised it. Uh, you know again, uh, uh, Painter was uh, the salvage officer for this, uh, and and they're pulling into the dock. And here you got, <clears throat> this is this is West Virginia uh, coming into the dock finally. Um, 63 days it took to raise the, the West Virginia, a ship that many thought would never be able to be raised, let alone ever get, uh, you know, uh, go back into the fleet. It was, it was so badly damaged, uh, but 63 days, Painter had it, uh, had it up and, uh, going into the uh, dry dock number one, which was a smaller dry dock than two, which were Cal which California went into. But the reason that they, they put the West Virginia in dry dock number one was to uh, leave the dry dock number two available for, you know, major, major warships, carriers, uh, and, and maybe other, some other major warships that were battle damaged, you know, from, from uh, down the South Pacific. So they brought these these battleships in, and they also had a uh, even though they were in there, they had a 70, 72 hour plan to pull them out if we, if we had uh, major combatant ships that were damaged that needed to go into the dock, you know, returning from the, the South Pacific. So they they had all this uh, they had all this planned out. The interesting thing here is uh, Painter uh, was not a he's not a line officer. He's a, he's a C, uh, civil engineer. <clears throat> On this pier, there's a, you're gonna see a letter here in a second. Uh, there's another civil engineer, an ensign, who, who watched this uh, and he was so very proud because Painter, not being a line officer, is the one who um, is up on the bridge conning the ship uh, from where it was raised and into the dry dock. And here's the letter. Uh, this is in 2001. I, I, I know I didn't mention this, but I have tracked down um, uh, Painter's son, who is also a civil engineer uh, and a Vietnam veteran. Um, and uh, he, he shared this letter with me uh, from this Mr. Edward Martin, the ensign on the pier. And he's saying uh, in here, uh, uh, you know, but Lieutenant Painter, uh, his capability was so outstanding. He was fully accepted into the as the officer in charge of the West Virginia Virginia salvage operation. Uh, the manner in which he executed his duties was inspirational to all hands, and he to him this was like a major deal to watch a civil engineer, not a line officer, uh, bring this ship, this large ship, into the dock. <clears throat> Here you can see. Uh, this is West Virginia in the dock, and you can see they're removing the patches, and then down on the bottom you can see the concrete. In the, they're they're breaking up the blocks of concrete. And one of the ways that they had to, to to break it up and remove it from the hull was small charges of dynamite to blow it away because it was so adhered it, it adhered uh, so uh, tightly uh, to the hull that that's what they used to to break it up. <clears throat> and they're just taking taking the patches away at this point. <clears throat> so I have the, the, the these three giants uh, here uh, for a reason, because it was at Pearl Harbor that Painter becomes his legend begins. Uh, he's, he, he's just so outstanding. He, he's, his leadership, his initiative inspired everybody. Uh, within the salvage uh, crews of both those ships uh, to, to do these uh, unbelievable things that have never had never been done before. 
And <clears throat> you will see that he ends up working for uh, all three of them, uh, but in particularly uh, Admiral Halsey. <clears throat> So this is, you know, the, the, the war in the Pacific is a war of airfields. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the map there is just to kind of give you an idea of the battle space of what, you know, uh, the massive area of the Pacific Ocean and, and the, the, you know, the, and what we have to do, um, the island hopping campaign to work our way up toward uh, Japan. <clears throat> So in 1942, uh, July 17th, uh, Painter arrives in uh, Nomea, No Caledonia, and uh, from that point on, he's he's uh, doing work on uh, you know Henderson Field. This is a picture of uh, a, a current uh, a modern day picture of that area, and then you could see the you know, the outline of where Henderson Field was and fighter strip number one and all that kind of stuff. Painter was uh, involved in, in, in all this, the fighter strips and getting them built. Um, and, uh, you know, again, he, his legend <laughs> is only growing. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's using his, his skills as a civil engineer and all the, all the things that he's done in China uh, and, uh, and applying his knowledge uh, uh, here on the Guadalcanal and uh, in other areas as we move forward. So by this time, <clears throat> we're looking at moving up the Solomons. You know, the next big operation uh, it was going to be, you know, Operation Toenails as part of the, the whole Elkton uh, three-phase plan of, of, you know, New Guinea and, and, and moving up to uh, Bougainville and through Rabaul and all that kind of stuff. But the first jump, the first real jump was to New Georgia, Operation Toenails. And the, um, where Painter comes in here is that... <clears throat> Admiral Halsey and, and others, they, you know, they, they've, lear they've learned these lessons while in Guadalcanal, and they know that in order to go to these other islands, we need airstrips. We need to establish bases. So how are we going to do that? Uh, well, the first opportunity comes with uh, Operation Toenails. Uh, and one interesting thing here, too, is that while on Guadalcanal, while on Guadalcanal um, they create a uh, uh, a reconnaissance uh, combat reconnaissance school made up of Army Marine instructors, and then one uh, Australian Coast Watcher, uh, Flight Lieutenant Corrigan, who uh, are part of the cadre uh, to teach this uh, the, this survival uh, combat reconnaissance uh, school. And, uh, you know, there were about 100 military folks that went through it. And obviously, Painter was one of them. Uh, but Painter gets sent because of his skill set and uh, of, of, of construction. For the, for the Operation Toenails, um, the operation, we didn't have enough fighter cover. We didn't have the carriers uh, to support. So we have to build airfields. The problem was... Uh, there's going to be none, no carrier av carriers available for for the New Georgia operation, as far as you know the the amount of aircraft that we need. So <clears throat> to cover the Munda uh, the uh, the Munda landings, which was the primary uh, objective in Beachhead, we had to build a quickie field, and that's what they called it, a quickie field. So in February of forty three and May of forty three. Painter goes into, uh, goes to Segi, links up with Kennedy, uh, Coast Watcher Kennedy, and they scout out uh, vast areas of New Georgia. And this is just a, just a, a, a manner in how they would do it. They would go by dugout canoe to a certain point, and then they would work overland uh, looking for 
these the suitable airfield. Well, the thing was, they did all of this humping all over the place, and Painter couldn't find the suitable site to build an airfield. So they came back, they get back to Seggy Point, um, the southernmost part of New Georgia, uh, and he realizes he's he realizes that this is the spot all along. It was Seggy Point. So he goes back, reports back to um, headquarters. Uh, they set up this this uh, this operation. Uh, J June twenty first, um, they go in. Uh, they have some army units, go, an army unit go in to uh, hold off any Japanese because who might be coming in the area. Some Marines too were involved. Uh, while the surveyors go out and they literally staked out the airfield with stakes and string um, and laid it all out. So by June 30th, uh, when the invasion started, uh, they brought in the CBs, the bulldozers came off, they cleared the whole, the, the, the land and uh, within, uh, and they had it done in 10 days. Now the story behind that is Painter was a very, Painter's a very brashful, boastful individual. And uh, when they were first talking about doing this, he said, uh, they'd probably take about 30 days. That's what the experts were saying. And Painter said, <clears throat> well, it could be done in 15. But if you're good like me, you could do it in 10. So they, they actually turned the tables on him in a jokingly way uh, uh, and, and used that uh, against him. And he, he once said, like, you know, I, I opened my big mouth, but uh, he did do it in 10 days uh, under under some very adverse conditions um, where they the coral they were using was dead coral. It got washed out in a major rainstorm. So they had to go get live coral, which they, they used dynamite, cracked the reef and brought just loads and loads of live coral onto the runway and, and spread it out. Uh, they, 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 there was so many other uh, set, they had setbacks within his 10 days, but he ended up making it. Uh, he lived up to his boasts. And this is the runway as it's being under construction. The first aircraft was a Marine Corsair. Here's Painter congratulating the, the pilot who was a uh, enlisted pilot, by the way, a sergeant, uh, congratulating the, the individual uh, who, who came in on the first landing. And then they were in business. This is a uh, map of, or a blueprint of Segi Airfield. Uh, this was given to me by uh, his son, Will Painter. Uh, he gave it to me in three sections. I was able to get our graphics department to piece it together, but that's it. And it's got, you know, the runway, the revetments, the, the, the taxi loops. And over here on the left, got a road, Painter Road. Uh, just, just so you know, at the very top, You'll see another road, it says Kennedy, Kennedy Road, because that's where uh, Coast Watcher Kennedy's hideout was uh, uh, leading up to this operation, was on top of that, that hill uh, in the jungle. <clears throat> this is Seggy Point Airfield today. Uh, and, and obviously a look what it, you know, look what it looked like back then, but it's uh, still still there. <clears throat> so by this point, you know, Painter finishes the Seggy Point uh, airfield and, you know, he, he was there for a day or so just taking in, you know, uh, what, what had transpired and the accomplishment. And they told him to get his, at, his butt back to, uh, to uh, Guadalcanal and, uh, you know, turn it over to the, to the, to the 47 CB battalion. Uh, we got we got other work to do because now we're thinking of other play other uh, other operations. So the next one that he he handles uh, is the Vela Lavella uh, uh, landing. Uh, but they went in there and scouted out uh, an area for airfield. And this is like the first bypass, the first uh, jump where we bypass an island, which was called Megara, and instead went to Vela Lavella, which was a little further up. Uh, on our way up toward Rabal. So, so by this time he's made a, a, a name for himself and he gets ordered to uh, Washington DC to see Admiral King uh, because he's gonna lead an expedition 
It's called the Painter Expedition to China uh, to, to survey the coast of China. And <clears throat> he's going, you know, they're going to they're going to link up there with uh, Admiral Admiral Milton Miles uh, of the, you know, the uh, Naval Group China. And he Painter's going to take his uh, his uh, his uh, men uh, and they're going to go scout out uh, uh, the China coast. Uh, I, I threw this in here only because uh, the guy in the middle, the very standing in the very center, uh, Charlie Noble was was Painter's XO, uh, a really good, uh, really good leader, and um, um, he was his XO, and he actually wrote a he wrote the uh, the 1967 story about the Painter expedition. Uh, in uh, the, uh, it's called the uh, Engineer, it's a periodical, uh, August 1967 uh, period, uh, edition. <clears throat> Here, uh, they're doing, a, on the left, uh, that's a Painter doing a practice jump um, prior to the mission. And there's a couple pictures of them on their, on their, uh, um, in their Chinese uh, uh, uniforms to blend in. Uh, they all spread out along the China coast. They all had sectors. They put up a weather station uh, and they were looking for Admiral King uh, d d d wanted to uh, scout these areas out so that we could use, we could make landings there in preparation for uh, you know, the assault on Japan, which was uh, you know coming closer and closer as uh, time went by. So this was a major, uh, four and a half month mission, uh, and uh, he barely got out of there alive. He was almost captured at one point um, near, uh, uh, I think near uh, Shanghai somewhere, uh, but was able to move, move, get out of there in time. Mrs. Painter, uh, he, he ended up getting awarded, uh, I think it's like five uh, legions of merit with valor. Um, this is him. Uh, receiving one of them. Admiral Nimitz uh, giving him a, another, another Legion of Merit. This is 1945. This is on Guam. <clears throat> and here's some words from uh, Admiral Halsey. Uh, you know, Bill Painter turns jungles into metropolitan airports, a delightful companion, a great friend. Well done, Bill Halsey. <clears throat> So by this time, uh, the war's over. Uh, uh, Painter in 1946, he gets he gets married in China to a uh, former Russian baroness's daughter. Uh, he at the time, at the very very end of the war, he was working for General Wiedemeyer in China uh, for a brief period, and they knew each other. Uh, and uh, we, General Wiedemeyer uh, was there and hosted uh, the wedding and stood up for uh, Bill Painter. War ends. He's a civilian now. He goes back to, uh, he's working for this uh, major company. This is all about the Marshall Plan and rebuilding Europe. So he's got, he goes to Greece where he's, uh, he's building all these infrastructure projects. And one of them, one of them is the, uh, and I hope I pronounce it right, Goro, uh, Gorgo Potop, Potopamus Bridge. Gor I had it right before, Gorgo Potopamus Bridge. So the bridge, uh, because you know Greece was occupied by the Germans, uh, a British SES unit with the help of uh, Greek partisans blew the bridge up. And so again, now after the war, the war is over, here we go, we're gonna, gonna rebuild the bridge. And, um, you know, he's, he's doing these projects. <clears throat> so at that time he had, uh, he was finishing it up, fish, finishing up projects in Greece and he had other projects. He was gonna, him and his family, uh, we're gonna head on to uh, Ethiopia where we, there were other projects that he already had contracts on. Uh, but because he's he's working for you know the Army Corps of Engineers, he has to go back to Washington to sign off on 
on the paperwork, I guess is what it was. So while he's in Washington, he gets invited to a, uh, to a, um, a picnic, uh, a picnic, it's a picnic uh, cruise down the Potomac River with, you know, Washington socialites and, and all this stuff. So he shows up, um, there's a boat blast, uh, the boat just, just, you know, disintegrates, explodes. Uh, but this is the newspaper article about it on July 12th. It actually happened on July 10th. This is it right here. Um, what happened was there was everybody was to show up at uh, 1.30 in the afternoon. So during that period of time, while all the guests were coming aboard and mingling, uh, they did a refueling operation on the uh, to refuel the boat. And uh, it was about 1.50 in the afternoon by this time. Uh, they refueled. They just started to pull away from the from the dock and there was this an explosion, the boat disintegrated and, and blew apart. Uh, you see the picture there, uh, the newspaper clip to the left. Uh, the left, the person on the left is a Brigadier General. He's the Army PAO, he's the Army's PAO officer. Um, him and, uh, and Painter both were the two that were killed. The, uh, people were injured. Um, you can see the boat, it does, you know, it's, it's just sunk in the water. Uh, but the hero of the day was former Ambassador Biddle to the right with him and his wife. They're sitting in the front of the boat. They got blown out, but Biddle, uh, and they weren't hurt. They you know, a couple scrapes, cuts, that's it. Biddle ends up saving the Brigadier General, gets them out of the water and, it, it, you know, helps others, uh, you know, through this tragic event that just happened. And there's just a picture of a boat like that, which is a, uh, it was a 37 foot wheeler trunk cabin cruiser. Uh, so that's, that's a modern view, but that's what it si looked similar to. Um, here's Painter that, you know, he was buried in Arlington, the funeral. Uh, I've done research on, <laughs> on this. Uh, you know, the, 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 the article went across the, all across the United States about this event because what Painter was doing, doing during the uh, uh, war in the, in the Second World War uh, was never talked about. And, you know, now it's getting out there and they, 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 they send these, these articles uh, across the United States. Almost every major newspaper across the country was talking about uh, Painter um, and, and, you know, the exploits. And it's just sad that we have a guy that did so much and gets you know, dies in the fashion that he died in, uh, you know, years later. And this is just a picture of what the family donated to the CB Museum in Port Wenemi. Uh, this is an older picture. Uh, and I've been to Port Wenemi just two years ago. Uh, I didn't see this. Uh, I don't even know if it's still, they probably have, have it, but I'm not sure if it's uh, even still there. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 I'll just end with this. Um, these are the kind of things that, you know, the, the, uh, the planning, the strategy going forward in, in this major global war that those three, you know, King, Nimitz, Halsey, and, the, and others were thinking about in order to, you know, to, to move through the Pacific. I hope today our leaders are, are thinking about things like this. Uh, and I understand that we're in a more modern age and technology is all there, but there's, I think, uh, was it Secretary Lehman mentioned, uh, we are see uh, uh, about 50,000, you know, uh, islands out in the Pacific and all that. Uh, yeah, and we, you know, we may need them one of these days. So I, I guess what I'm saying is we really need to be thinking. I hope that our leaders are thinking about um, and not relying on technology, but thinking about, you know, things, you know, the, the things that are underlying, because I don't think they were thinking about sending guys forward and scouting out uh, occupied islands throughout the South Pacific you know, early on in the war. I think that was just, they figured it out over time. We have to do this and that. And I, I really do hope that we're, we're thinking that way uh, in those terms.
Uh, thank you very much.